Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to episode 158 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And I'm Barbara. What's up? Not a whole lot. What's going on with you, Barb? It's Friday afternoon. It's, it's a cool 68 degrees. We got another cold front. My God. Wow. <laughs> We're getting cold fronts, which is super crazy for Florida. But I love it. We run this weekend and enjoy it. Do some planting and soak up some sun. What about yourself there, Mr. Indiana boy? Well, first day of April, we had snow. Oh, so no. It wasn't much. Nothing stuck, but it was enough to make everybody in Indiana go, Oh, what the hay? <laughs> <laughs> Better you than me. Ah, yeah, yeah. Better than anybody but me. Yep. So this weekend, Barb, Vision 21, Yay! down in Nashville, Tennessee. You looking forward to it? Oh, my God. Am I looking forward to it? Like, big time. I cannot wait to travel. I cannot wait to see everybody. Cannot wait. Super excited. So I know they're doing a new format because we live in new times now where your registration badge will have a color. And it will tell people, stay away from me. I don't want to touch you. Oh, really? Yeah. And another color is like, hey, it's okay to elbow bump. Oh, my God. Are you serious? But stand back from me when we talk. That's And awesome. then there's one that, like, <laughs> welcomes big hugs, French kissing, what? fingers and ears. Oh you know, it's all okay. So I was just curious what color you're going to be wearing. That one. <laughs> you're... I'm the one that's, yeah, I'm good with whatever. Well, yeah. Yeah. Fist bumping, hugging, whatever. I'm good. I think it's interesting that they're doing it that way. And you Well, know. you're on the board still, so I did not know that, but I like it. That's that's smart. Really smart. Yeah, I have classified information that no one else can know. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like registration badges. Well, better a color than have to say anything and feel uncomfortable. I really like that. Idea. That's what they're trying to eliminate. Yeah. I mean, you're, everyone's going to go up to each other and like, do you what reach do do? out a hand? Do you not reach out a hand? <laughs> What do I do? It's it's awkward. I mean, it's even awkward when people stop by the lab. Yes, it's like I you know. just stand there and it's like, I okay, I guess I won't shake your hand or not. Yeah. So if anybody's looking to get away from family that you've been seeing so much of and spend some time with some fellow lab people, there's still time to head over to NADL.org and register for one of the coolest meetings of the year. This year being held at the Gaylord Opryland Resort in Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it, but Barb will be there. So make sure you notice her registration and give her a big hug. So we talk a lot about conferences and meetings, but I'm sure there are a lot that we don't know about. So on April 24th, the Dental Lab Association of Alabama is having their meeting in Huntsville and they're having a meeting, which is fantastic. So head over to dlaal.org to learn more about it if you are in the area. And it's really important that we support our local and national meetings, guys. If you know a meeting that you want us to mention on the podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at VoicesFromTheBench.com, and we will support it. Yeah, I didn't even know Alabama had an association. I think it's great. I do too. The more we can have them, the more meetings we can have, the stronger we can become. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a full-service lab. Barb, you say you're at a full-service lab, don't you? Yes. Yeah, but there's a lot of things that we don't do. We don't do ortho. We don't do sleep devices. But one thing that we do do, and that I really struggle doing... Flexible partials. I am not a fan of them. They are hard to do. The people are hard to find. So whichever one you do, they're usually a pain. And today's guest has a really nice alternative. Justin Marks has brought printed Valplast to the masses. Justin comes from the family that created Valplast, and he knows our pains with the products. With a simple scan of a model, Justin and his company, Arfona, will print you... Teeth and all, a flexible partial. Justin talks about moving Valplast from analog to digital, the ease of workflow, and the time he spent teaching other technicians. So join us as we chat with 
Justin Marks. Hey, Barb. I called Oradent the other day about their P5 milling machine. Super. How did it go? I was introduced to the consumables Oradent offers, such as Delta Zirconia, Oradent ZR, Oradent cutting tools, and Quest PMMA. How convenient. You know what? You can buy the mill and the materials from them. Yeah, if you think that's convenient, you can also buy furnaces by Napertherm, and vacuums by Renfert. Plus, I don't have to talk to a different person every time I call. I have a rep dedicated just for me. I have heard that their service is amazing. Absolutely. Oradent offers high-quality cutting tools made here in the USA, and they have great options for zirconia. Delta Zirconia, which is a super cost savings for labs, and Oradent ZR, made proudly here in the U.S. of A. Do they still offer dental alloys? You know, Oradent started off manufacturing alloys and will always provide high-quality alloys for dental labs, one of the few companies in the U.S. to still manufacture their own alloys. Is there anything that they don't supply dental labs? Actually, they also offer dental scanners and a 3D printer from Shining 3D. Hold up. Does that scanner have its own design software? Actually, Oradent offers ExoCAD for your designing needs. Nice. I'm not the best with technology and setting up all of this equipment, just saying. Well, we know, but that's <laughs> fine. Oradent has a technical support team who can help with installing or troubleshooting any problems. Wow, Oradent definitely is a one-stop shop for any dental lab's needs. How do we get in touch with them? You can always call our friends at Oradent at 1-800-422-7373. Or you can visit them at their website at oradent.com. We super appreciate your support of the podcast, Oradent. Thank you so much. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. We'd like to welcome to the podcast today, Justin Marks from Arfona out in New York. How are you, sir? Can't complain. How are you guys today? Great. Doing fantastic. So you contacted me, I think it was on Facebook Messenger, with an intriguing subject. Printing of flexible partials. Mm. I have never kept it a secret how much I dislike doing flexible partials in the lab. <laughs> with the time it takes to do them, the technical skill, and the amount of remakes and adjustments, it's just a headache. But hopefully you're here to teach us a way that we can do this a little bit smoother. If I haven't sold you on the product by the end of this podcast, then I may <laughs> as well just quit. Because you, you hit all the pain points right on the head right there. Oh, man, I can't stand this stuff. I don't even do it. I just have people do it. and it's, I can't stand it. So, Justin, I see you're associated with the digital dental craftsmen. That's correct. A great group we've had on before. But we kind of like to start off by finding out how you ended up a technician. How'd you learn about our industry? Well, like many people in this industry, I learned at the bench and I will kind of go over the history of not just my own career and professional path, but yeah. that ties in very easily with the kind of Valplast history. Interesting fact, the inventor of Valplast was my grandfather. Shut up! Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, was Valplast the first flexible? Valplast was the first flexible. It was wow. developed in the late 1940s and kind of first came on the market commercially in 1953. Wow. Seriously, it's been around that long? That long. More than 70 years now. I had no idea. I always thought it was like a 90s thing. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Did they give your uh, grandfather credit for that? Yep. No, he's he's yeah. widely recognized as the first. And I mean, it was, it was probably a good decade before even any other competitors tried to mimic what he was doing. You know, it was an interesting time in dentistry because, I mean, really prior to anything that we started to do digitally more recently with dentures, removables haven't really changed in 100 years or so, right? I mean, sure. yeah. Yeah. frames are done through lost wax casting, you know, acrylic dentures, polyamethyl with acrylate, that you know, lost wax as well hasn't really changed. So, you know, this was in the 1940s when synthetic polymers were kind of just being invented for, at the time, military purposes because of the war effort. Mm -hmm. So nylon was invented at that time. And that's when uh, he first started experimenting to kind of get away from alloys. And, you know, I mean, at that time, gold was actually very prominent for partial frames, but then chrome cobalt came into its own element and uh, he, he offered an alternative to that. So a lot of that was driven by cosmetics. Some of it was driven by cost because of the, the cost of gold alloy. 
And so here we are today, more than 70 years later, and it's a great material. It obviously has the, the high brand value attached to it that dentists still know and love. And even if technicians <laughs> don't uh, don't like don't like finishing them, that's nothing new. Um, I've been hearing that for my whole career, for sure. No, I feel bad. Did I insult your grandfather? Not at all. No, no. I mean, uh, you know, th- this is what gives us kind of drive and motivation to improve the product, right? So yeah, yeah. So I came in about 15 years ago. At that time, my grandfather was still alive and working. He, he passed away at age 91 and was still working at wow. the bench when that happened. Oh my God. Really yeah. So amazing. Any of us think we're getting out anytime soon. That's probably not the case. <laughs> That's going to be uh, me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, join the club. So I, I wasn't really raised in the lab like a lot of people were because it was on my mom's side of the family. And then we actually lived on the other side of the country. But my uncle, who is now the president and CEO of Outlast, uh, has, has been since the 1990s, uh, Peter Nagy. He was raised in the lab. So I'm mm. actually a third generation of the Valpost family. Nice. So is Valpost like a privately owned family run company? I mean, yes, it is. Wow. Oh. I had no idea. Yeah. I always figured it was big and corporate yeah. owned by, you know, some sort of chemical company or something. That's interesting. That's good to know. Yeah. And that really yeah. gives us the flexibility to move quickly and develop new things in a way that, you know, by focusing on kind of a single product instead of an entire portfolio that I think that's a valuable asset to us. So you didn't grow up in the lab and 15 years ago, what brought you into it? I was actually looking for a career change. I um, had initially done my studies in music performance and did that for a little bit. And I love music and, and still do. But, you know, obviously, as, as any music or struggling artist can attest to, was looking for something a little more stable. So sure. at that the time, I was not living in New York. And uh, so I decided to move back here, join the family business and, and always had an interest in it. I mean, just the blending of art and science. And, and nowadays, we can add technology to that. I thought that was really cool. And I mean, 15 years ago. So, you know, I was learned how to do everything traditionally, you know, dentures and parcels. That's what we were doing at the time. We, we, we had our own family laboratory in addition to Valplast uh, manufacturing and distribution. So I, you know, learned at the bench and spent a lot of time with my grandfather, picked his brain. That was obviously very valuable and something I miss very much today. Not having that, yeah. he passed away in 2008. But yeah, and then and 15 years ago, this is really before CAD CAM had certainly touched uh, digital dentures and, and partials. You know, it was just starting to come into its own element in other aspects of fixed uh, restorative dentistry. So now it's, I mean, that, that really gave me a whole new outlook on what we're doing and a breath of fresh air for where we can go from here. Yeah. So Valplast was a company, and then there was also a family lab. That's correct. Same building? Or? Yeah, the lab actually came first. That's Master Touch Dental Lab. Okay. Yeah, back in the day was a very large steel frame lab. It was actually... Wait a minute, steel? Well, uh, chrome cobalt. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it <laughs> I was, was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, No, no. Um, I think the brand was Duralium. It was a Duralium franchise lab back in the day. So it was all, okay. all partial frames, and that became kind of all removables and sold off the partial frame division, or at least closed it down and probably the, I think it was the late nineties or early two thousands. It was actually right before I came in. Mm -hmm. I did get into partial frames up at one point when I was managing the lab after that, because we were doing some CAD cast, but not a lot of that. And it was basically by the time I came in predominantly Valplast. I have a very different experience coming into flexible partials than most other technicians in the industry, because I had an extremely myopic view of what we did. It was basically the only product we offered. And I was learning from the best of the best. Other technicians that come into it, it's because, you know, usually they're looking at buying it for their lab if they're in management or ownership position, or if they're a bench technician, it's because their owner or manager said, hey, I'm buying the system, you're going to have to go learn how to use it. Usually, you know, with the predisposition that they've already been doing acrylic dentures or cast partials and, you know, some other form of, of dental lab technology. So when they come into it, obviously it's a learning curve. And I didn't have the same experience because it was the first thing I learned. And then I learned everything else after. Oh, yeah. That must have made everything else really easy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yes and no. I did go and get my CDT and full dentures and partials. Nice. Yeah. So a lot of that was self-study because I didn't have the opportunity to go to school. Coincidentally, now, years later, I actually do teach as an adjunct at New York City College of Technology. Do you really? Uh, Yeah. Really? That's amazing. Yeah. um, I I took a couple semesters off because I got so busy with what we're doing here, but I, I really enjoy teaching. So I was teaching the RPD courses there. Wow. That's really fun. But I'm probably also the only faculty member there that didn't actually go to a former college. Yeah. Or, or, yeah. or even yeah. that, that same school. So, yeah. you know, again, a, a very different trajectory and, and career path. Same for me. That's awesome. So when you came in 15 years ago and you started learning Valplast, what's changed since then? Anything? Or is it still pretty much traditionally made with the... Uh... What's that big thing that people turned real? Yeah, the press. The press, yeah. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) at the end of the day, uh, at the molecular level, Valplast is the same. Whether you are 
hand injecting it, whether you're using an automatic injector or whether you're 3D printing it, the material has stayed the same. Mm -hmm. That's the bottom line. That's something that, that we you know, have thought was very important because the material itself, the way it performs optimally is actually what's so popular about it, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the brand is very valuable too. It's, it's the one that dentists still ask for. It's kind of oh yeah, almost, you know, it's Valplast or there's generic. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I call it the Kleenex of tissue paper. It, it really is. Yeah. And there are very few brands in dentistry as a whole that you can kind of make that claim to, which which is sure. phenomenal. But, you know, so different ways of processing it. But as far as how it's designed, what it's intended to do, how it performs, that's largely stayed the same. So when you go from like a traditional way of using the Valplast material to a new an innovative printed way. Who works on that for you guys? I basically was running the R&D team at Valplast for a number of years. I was doing technical development, R&D, uh, running the whole education program, teaching a ton of courses and lecturing uh, around the world on the product, which which was great. This was, I was in my mid-20s I was before I was married. This was really the time the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You still have energy. You're not tired. Yeah. All the time. Now, yeah. now, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I find sleep when I can get it, which is few and far between. Yeah. But um, yeah, but this is also around the same time that I mean, we're going back now more than 10 years that we saw the first CAD CAM system for partial dentures, which was the sensible system. If you remember that. Um, yes, I do. Yeah. I listened recently to your interview with Tim Bertram. I have oh, a ton of respect right. for Tim's a great guy and has done great things in the industry for, for partials. He made reference to that too, because we probably caught wind of that around the same time. I mean, when, when you come into this doing only partials, of course, something like that is, has potential to be very disruptive and beneficial if you look at it through the, mm -hmm. through the right lens. So we immediately caught note of that, thought it was really cool to design the partial on, on screen, 3D print a resin pattern, and, and then cast it. So for us, the challenge was, okay, A, how do we adapt the software to design a flexible denture instead of a partial frame? Mm -hmm. And B, what is manufacturing going to look like? You know, it, it might look great on a screen in, in a CAD file, but how do you turn that into a tangible object to, to go yeah. in somebody's mouth? So yeah. we did have a system early on where we were printing, you know, essentially resin base plates that looked like a flexible base plate. It had clasps, all the border extensions, block out everything you need, but it didn't have teeth and, and it wasn't in anything that even closely resembled Valplast. So what we were doing was we would take that base plate, set up the teeth in wax, and then basically flask that up and convert it to an injected denture. So that, you know, got us halfway there and it was it was very precise, very accurate. You could use that for a try-in, which was very cool because it already had clasps on it. But we yeah. kind of wanted to take it one step further and actually print the material. And so when it comes to 3D printing nylon, there's really only kind of two technologies that lend itself well to doing that. One is selective laser sintering, which is, you know, using a powder of nylon and then a, a energy source, usually a laser would, would fuse that or melt it together into a 3D object. So very similar to selective laser melting that we use for metal. Oh, okay. And the, the issue with that is not only the cost of the machine because they are extremely expensive, extremely. but also that would have totally changed the physical properties and appearance of the material as well. It would have had to have been reformulated. It's very difficult to get those materials in anything with translucency or pigmentation they're usually white or black and that's about it and then so, it won't be valplast anymore. and then it won't be valplast anymore so the other other yeah. option to print nylon is using fused deposition modeling and so when we talk about fused deposition modeling that's essentially taking a thermoplastic monofilament so like a, a plastic wire heating that through a nozzle and then depositing that you know, layer by layer into a 3D object as it cools down. And that's what we did. Wow. You sound like a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies if these words are... No, it's you, fine. It's You know, going over I anybody's head. Visualize it. You, yeah, you can see I live and breathe this stuff. But uh, oh, yeah. but it's fun to talk about for anybody who, yeah. who's willing to listen. Yep. So which direction did you go? You had to go the, the second one, right? That's exactly what we did. And the benefit yeah. there is that there was a lot, and still is, there's a lot of collective knowledge from other industries on building FDM printers because... Because there's a huge movement of consumers and hobbyists who build their own and share open source plans for building your own and modifying them. So we basically took what we needed to from little of this, little of that, put our minds to work and essentially built our own FDM printer. And that can be done for relatively low cost too. So. so these are the printers I see on like Facebook where people get spools of plastic. Yep. That's exactly right. So um, yeah. obviously ours has been souped up a little bit to handle imagine, you know, more challenging yeah. materials and, and medical device materials, but that's essentially in a nutshell where it came from. At what point did you start becoming 
Arfono? Arfona. Yeah, Arfona. Arfona. Yeah. So when did that come about? That happened. Arfona was actually incorporated in 2016, but in the years kind of leading up to that, when we were doing this heavy R and D at Galplast, mm -hmm. that basically fed right into this project. And, and so our phone is essentially a spinoff of, of Valplast and what we were doing okay. there. And there is some common ownership between the two companies. So we are very closely related, not just professionally, but obviously the, the owner of Valplast is also my uncle. So sure, we, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a great you know strategic partnership and, and we have a great relationship there professionally and personally. So that is great. Yeah, so it was 2016 and the initial focus was selling hardware and materials. So we were selling printers. We, we developed our own, put that on the market, uh, started shipping those in around 2017. Hmm. And so, yeah, those printers can be found in, I think, more than 30 countries now. Wow. Yeah. And those printers only print your Valplast type material. That's correct. So, okay. and we do have some other, you know, kind of accessory type products that you can print our sure. custom tray material and denture try-ins and, and some, you know, study model, low resolution type stuff with that for yeah. prototyping. But it's very different than obviously all of the other dental printers that have taken the industry by storm. How did you, um, up, how did you come up? All right. Elvis, stop asking all the questions. Sorry, Please. I get excited. How did you guys come up with the name? Ah, good question. So, Arfona is derived from the inventor of Alplast's first, middle, and last name. So, uh, the inventor of Alplast was Arpad Fodor Nagy, Hungarian uh, technician, my uncle. So, the first two letters of Arpad, first two letters of Fodor, and the first two letters of Nagy, Arfona. And did you come up with that? <laughs> I came cool. up with that. Yeah, I was looking for something that was kind of unique and people would want to know the backstory or where it came uh, from. But, uh, but yeah, but obviously still, you know, ties itself very deep into into our roots and what we do. Wow. So is that your baby or are you guys all connected in that business as well? Yeah, no, it was, that is my baby. And that was, you know, from 2017 to 2020, really right up until the pandemic, we were selling materials and hardware and traveling around the world to, you know, do courses and lecture on it. And then COVID-19, you know, really disrupted that a bit because we couldn't get out and really do any support or training. And so what we did, you know, even though all of these selling aspects of 3D printed Valplast make sense on paper, there's still a learning curve to it. You know, it's learning 3D printing, it's learning a different type of 3D printing. There is still a post process that comes along with that. So, you know, anybody who's struggling to finish and polish a Valplast traditionally, that may carry over those challenges may carry over to 3d printed as well so if we weren't getting out there to do courses and installations obviously that kind of derailed things for a little bit there so yeah. what we did is we set up our own printing center in a new facility in anglewood cliffs new jersey which is where i am right now mm -hmm. right across the river from new york and we uh, built the world's largest print farm for valplast flexible partials that's a great idea i bet you guys are busy we are busy and yeah i mean this is something that there was a demand for all along even you know okay. when we were focused Focused on printers and getting those out there. People still wanted to send cases. They didn't want to make the investment. They didn't want to learn it, whatever the reason. And now that we're, I mean, even compared to three or four years ago, even more digitally integrated now than we were then, you know, almost every lab has a scanner now, more and more docs are buying an iOS system. So yeah, there's lots of room to get that acquisition and we'll, we'll do all the design and printing for you. Wow. So let's talk about that workflow. It used to be that a lab would buy a printer from you, buy the material, and do everything themselves. Yep. And that, as you mentioned, it's got to be a pretty large learning curve. So now that you're doing the printing, how does a workflow work for a lab to send? It's as simple as they need to create a new account on our customer portal on the website, upload yeah. a scan, and then we will design the case, send them a design preview for every case. They get to review it once they approve it. That starts the printing process, and then usually it ships in about two days from there after we print it. I'm going to need you to make that more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> more complicated? All right, let's do it. Let's do the, the, the easy, easy, the short, short. You upload a scan. Within 24 to 48 hours, you see a design. 48 hours after that, it ships. So four, to, oh, four days total. That's amazing. Yeah. So you guys have your own design team. Do some of the labs design their own? We got that request very early on and we still do. And we did entertain it initially and ran into problems very quickly with fits. Yeah. And also our design team would usually have to basically make a lot of revisions anyways, you know, because there are things that are, it has to be designed for, you know, with certain parameters to make it acceptable for printing and also yeah. just for it to function and, and work in the mouth, which is something that that's above all what we probably pride ourselves on more than anything is just the inside knowledge of how these things are supposed to be designed and function and, and fit from a theoretical standpoint. So, you know, 
take advantage of that. You know, the design is included in the price and you get a preview. So I uh, totally understand that, you know, lab techs want to have their input. You know, they, they don't want us to just do everything blindly. So draw you know, sketch up on your model before you scan it. If you have a texture scanner, uh, send some photos. If you're trying to copy an existing denture or, or you know, scan a denture. If you want to use that as a reference, that's a great tool. But you get a design preview in 3D. That's on our website. You get to rotate it. it. Works great on a mobile device. So you could literally be anywhere reviewing cases, approving them, and then and then we do everything else after. Well, to be honest with you, there's not a lot of that I've come across people that can actually design those cases. So I think it's a huge benefit. Plus, you take control of everything, and you know, you know how the thicknesses are and everything. Yeah. Your uh, printers, so. Yep. Uniform thickness. I mean, that plays such a crucial role. I mean, a difference of a quarter millimeter in thickness can make a denture too make rigid or too flexible yep. on something like this. Right. And, yep. and I mean, you're, you're really, you're correct to point out that it's hard to find technicians to really design these properly. It's mm -hmm. hard to find technicians to design frames properly, for sure. Any type of partial denture that's really, you know, unfortunately a, a lost or dying art. Yeah. There's a lot of skill and knowledge that goes into that. Uh, and flexible partials, you know, even though they are inherently easier to design than a metal frame, work there's a lot of thought that goes into it it should not be considered an arbitrary process right right oh i have a couple teeth here let's throw in some clasps let's just make it look like it's going to stay in place and, and boom we're done no you still have to think about retention support stability you know especially on more challenging cases like distal extensions you know these are all things we still need to take into account it's part of the rpd process we just do it in a different way. What software do you guys use to design? Yeah, we use predominantly uh, three shape for design. Okay. Yeah, at least for, for the design of the denture. We make pretty heavy use of Blender for dental and Mesh Mixer from the standpoint of cleaning up scans or getting them in the right yeah. format or orientation that we need. Blender has been very useful for that. They're alignment tool. You know, just the fact that both of those programs accept open formats. Sure. But three three shape has definitely been the best for design. They nice. yeah, they decided very early on, you know, with with our involvement that they were going to integrate tree with partial dentures that they were going to make a flexible RPD workflow for the removables module. And they did that before anybody else. So, you know, we're yeah. very happy to be working with them. Yeah. So are you training your design technicians on site? Yes. Obviously, we are starting to consider the possibility of doing more and more remote, you know, training and designers. Yep. Because we will have a need for that uh, once the immediate vicinity that we're in gets pretty saturated. But uh, yeah. yeah, especially for designers, because that's something that we we prefer that that our candidates have a dental background, you yep. know, some experience doing this. Something yeah. like finishing, we could probably teach that, you know, somebody who doesn't have a background. But CAD design is a special beast. Yeah. Do you guys print a model every time or? Yeah, we do right now. Yeah. You know, so, so the way the printing process works is that the uh, denture and the teeth are printed in two separate parts and then they, they have to get assembled together. We have a process for doing that. And then the whole thing gets finished, polished up and, and out the door. So in order to make sure that, yes, the teeth are in the right place, that yes, the denture fits properly, we do print a model for, for every case to check that before it goes out. We are getting to the point where... Um, a new technology that we developed and it's actually patent pending right now will actually be printing the teeth and the denture in a single build uh, as a multi-material process. Wow. So, cool. yeah, so that's cool. that's something new that we should have rolled out pretty soon here. And that'll allow us to print the denture and the teeth at the same time. So having the teeth in the right position and orientation is going to be less of an issue once it's coming off the printer already assembled. We're also investing in some post-processing semi-automated technology. So there'll be less hands-on time to actually handle a part after printing to help smooth mm. it out and, and get it polished up. So all of those things combined, you know, we'll probably be moving towards model this and you know, hopefully near future. Wow. How long does it take to print a uh, flexible? Um, if you're looking at just like a single, you know, unilateral, let's say one to three teeth, uh -huh. that'll print in under an hour. <laughs> Something, you know, like a bilateral partial, you're looking at more like two and a half, three hours. So if we... Yeah, that's still not bad. It's not bad. I mean, we can fill up a tray with usually... I mean, max eight to 10 partials. And I mean, it might print overnight or in some cases, even a full 24 hours, depending on how big it is. But we have mm -hmm. 40 printers stacked up here. So 40 printers. Yeah, yeah. that was my question. How many? Yeah. Are Holy moly. It's, it's a small printer. It's a small footprint. So we, we really want to, you know, we run it almost like a, like a farm, uh, like yeah. a print farm or think of a server <laughs> yeah. farm, right? So you could use that term. Yeah. Yep. 
How does that work? Does each printer have a computer to nest and all that? Or I'm curious how you have 40 printers. Yeah. Them. So, I mean, keep them organized. They're, I don't get it. they're networked. You don't need a separate computer for each one. You know, each one has its own, you know, dedicated firmware. And yeah. We can network them. We They can be standalone printing over a memory stick or, or like an SD card. So, uh, there's a couple of different wow. ways to address that. Yeah. Obviously, it's, it's a lot to manage all of them, but uh, we have some very talented people here that do that. Wow. So what's your role right now? You're not still sitting on a bench shooting Valplast, are you? Pretty rarely. I mean, I, it's funny. When I do it, I, I realize that I miss it and I don't miss it. I, yeah. I don't miss it because my hands start to hurt in a way that they didn't yeah. they didn't used to. But it's nice to do it once in a while. No, I mean, I, I still involve myself very much in the design process. I don't uh-huh. do a lot of designs hands-on myself, but at least managing the QC of that and making sure scans uh-huh. are organized and, and internal training. Obviously, that's a huge component. And a lot of it is, uh, you know, just in my role as CEO, partner with new distribution companies that we're talking to, uh, especially in international markets, you know, looking for some expansion models there. Some pretty big things in the works here as well. Yeah, nice. looking for new ways to get the product out there because still, you know, at the end of the day, even though we're tied to Valplast and we're doing all this cool stuff, you know, there's still a lot of people that don't know that this even exists. And so while they're grinding it out, you know, with a miscast here and spending 45 minutes to an hour finishing a case there, we can simplify that for them. And I realize some people are opposed to just outsourcing anything because because a lot of labs want to keep stuff internal. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, like you mentioned on, on previous episodes, you know, flexible partials are one of the top restorations that constantly get outsourced. So that's... Uh... Oh, I'll do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> do you guys service any dentists? No, not directly. Obviously. Yay. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, we made that decision very on that we wanted to distance ourselves from that. You know, yeah. let the labs do that. The labs are the ones that have the footprint to every dentist in the country. So, you know, let them handle that. And every lab also has a scanner at this point, or at least, you know, probably more than 90% do. So let them get the scans, get the impressions, you know, acquire all that data and send it to us. And then we'll work with the labs on that. Yep. Good call. If I sent you some and got them back, would my dentist be able to tell there's something different? Highly unlikely. If you've been shooting your own Valplast and you're the technician who's been, you know, finishing them for however uh-huh. many years, you might be able to tell slight differences. Yeah. The, the main one being that you don't get the same kind of simulated veining effect in it the way that you do like the fibers when you inject it. Mm-hmm. That gets washed out a little bit during the printing process, but the color, the translucency, that's all the same. Strength, the uh, material properties, that's all the same. Chances of air bubbles. Oh, not slim to none. Oh, yeah. you, Elvis. that's huge. I can't tell you how many we finish or you know, shoot, as they call it around here, and then they, and then there's bubbles. And you're like, well. You know what that is? That retraction, that's from the material not cooling down at the same rate in the thicker sections of the denture. And that can happen if you release it from pressure too early. And that problem grew once we saw the rise of automatic injectors. Because what they did was, yeah, it's very convenient to have your melting furnace and your press in the same machine because you basically push a button and walk away. But yeah. that flask heats up to a point where it doesn't really cool down properly under pressure because the heat source is right next to it. So ah. you take it out of the press too soon. If it's still hot, then that's basically, um, that's retraction, that's suck back. That's where, a lot of the, ah. that's where a lot of those air bubbles come from. I did not know that. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of those issues. And th- that's something that, I mean, and, and this is my argument in favor of digital dentures across the board is that, yes, even if you can do a handmade one really well, you're super skilled, you know, you're, you're working with the best of the best and you have that upper echelon of clientele to pay for the high end stuff. Nobody really wants to be flasking dentures and packing acrylic or injecting a, a flexible denture. Like, you know, let some of the automated process do that for you. And then if you want to customize it, you know, do your your staining, your your characterization afterwards. You can make a digital denture look really great. But as long as that baseline, the actual manufacturing is done through some type of digital or automated process, I mean, who wouldn't take that? Wow. What's being done more? What you're doing by printing them or traditional? Traditional by far. It's yeah. still the, the predominant method. Yeah. It makes sense. I mean, for 70-year-old technology and a lot of labs have, have invested in that, you know, at this yeah. point. So that, that makes total sense. And, and it's funny. It's like, even though we can hit all the bullet points for why the printed version is better and the ease of use and, you know, the simplicity of it. You know, some people don't want to step away from, yeah, but there isn't, I'm not waxing the teeth. You know, I don't, I don't get it, you know, Um, especially when it comes to doing a try-in and and we have a method for doing a digital try-in, but it's, it's a paradigm shift. Well, that's a great question. I can't do a setup and send it to you. Yeah. So we're taking the same approach that basically a lot of labs and, and manufacturers are advocating for digital full dentures where you may not have, basically we're printing a monolithic version you know, a 
prototype of what the proposed uh -huh. final denture is going to be. So whether it's like a white or a tooth colored material, you basically you print the teeth embedded in the base plate without clasps because mm. uh, you know, we don't have the same material for that. Sure. But you insert that in the mouth and yeah, you, you can't see the final tooth shade and you can't see the, the pink gingiva, you know, with wax. But it's very stable. It's a great diagnostic tool to confirm that, you know, your centric, your video, everything is where it needs to be. Hmm. You know, from my point of view as a technician, uh, working in a removable lab for 15 years, I think that's probably the most important aspect of a try-in is to confirm the bite. It's yeah. not to let the, the patient see that their tooth shade is not going to be bright enough because they're not getting, you know, <laughs> the, the bleach shade that they wanted. Yeah. So, you know... I've had to do way too many resets of, of teeth over the years because of bad bites. So now if we can digitize that. The cool thing about this process is, okay, so we send out a, a monolithic uh, try-in, you know, for, for the trial process. Mm -hmm. If no changes are needed, you don't need to send anything back to the lab, right? We uh, you, you basically yeah. just go onto your customer portal and say, hey, that design was perfect. Add some clasps to it, print the final valve class, and we'll have it printing that night. If you needed a messenger to come pick that up, articulated models with a wax setup, or if you needed to box that up and send it with FedEx or UPS, it's at least a day in shipping just to get even get back to the lab and then they have to process sure. it. So yeah. we'll have it done before that try and would even get back to the lab, which is great. And if you need adjustments to that, let's say you need a new impression, you need a new bite, take the new bite, rescan it. We'll take the same design, readapt it, do another try and or go to the final. It's up to you. But the whole process is designed to be simplified. Hmm. But there's no way for me to do a traditional setup and then scan it and then you kind of mimic it. No, I mean, we, we did develop a workflow early on when we were selling printers. We had customers who wanted to use denture teeth instead of, you know, print their teeth or, or mill their teeth. So, yeah. you know, there, there is a method to scan a wax setup and then basically design the denture base so that the, the teeth will fit into it. We don't offer that service here because then there would be a lot of shipping back and forth of, of wax setups and we don't... It'd be a nightmare. Yeah. We don't want to handle customer property in that yeah. way. Yeah. In the lab, it's it's a more cumbersome process. It's way more prone to error. And yeah, we, we'd rather just streamline it with the other options. <laughs> yeah, but that setup is something the doctor will notice is something's different. Yeah, that, that for sure. And so that, yeah, no, I mean, that, that's where, you know, it's, communication, education, you know, play, plays a role here. Now, at the same time, you know, with the rise in intraoral scanning, the purpose of a try-in may end up being a thing of the past, uh, depending on yeah. the, the size of the case or the, the you know the complexity of it. Because I think one of the biggest benefits of iOS for removables is that you can capture upper, lower, final impressions and a bite fully yeah. articulated in a single appointment. Wow. So if you can confirm that, and you can have the patient go through you know excursions and bite down and centric you know over and over again, and if it's repeatable and if it's obvious, scan that, capture it, and then you maybe don't need a try-in because it's pretty predictable what we do from there on. Hmm. Yeah. How many do you do with a try and compare to going straight to finish? Uh, very few, less than 10% at this really? point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Part of that is probably lack of information. You know, I'm sure some of our lab customers don't even know that that try and is an option. <laughs> One thing that has been pretty popular is we have some lab customers that as long as they have their, a 3D printer on their end that can print a try-in material, or really any biocompatible material for that matter, yeah. we'll do a design, send them back the STL file so they'll print that locally um, oh, to, to save go. some time. Yeah. And then we'll still print the final valve blast once it's gone through the try-in process, but that saves some time for sure. And some cost. Oh, absolutely. That's an interesting option. Yeah. yeah. So how has your company changed? I hate to bring up the pandemic, but you <laughs> said you were doing a lot of traveling, a lot of lecturing, yeah. um, going all over the place. And so well, now, <laughs> I guess now it's all webinars instead. Yeah. But, uh, I think everybody's probably tired of seeing Zoom everything over the last year, but yeah. uh, you know, it, it is what it is. And yeah, so other, other than the kind of very business model itself changing. So we launched our phone and printing services actually at the height of the pandemic in the New York area last year. We moved into our new facility facility in May. So oh. all the planning and, and, and everything was done in the two months leading up to that when New York was really on complete lockdown. So, you know, we did close for about a month or so and, and the employees that we had at the time were furloughed. Uh, but this was really before we had expanded into the service bureau anyways. So kind of started off in the new building, you know, with a clean slate. Some of our employees did manage to, to come over since we're, we're actually in a new state now. We were in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, now we're in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. Uh, so that was the big change was, you know, the business model going from hardware and materials over to, you know, predominantly service bureau. And we did that, basically built this out at the height of the pandemic. But it's been pretty smooth sailing ever since. You know, we, we've had staff members come down with COVID. So, you know, we have to go through the procedure of having them out, you know, test negative and quarantine. But the good news is anybody who did get 
test positive, they didn't spread it to anybody else in the lab. So at least, sure. at least what we're doing seems to be working. And yeah, so that's, that's it. I mean, uh, just the very nature of what we're doing now lends itself very well to a pandemic. Hopefully we never have to go through one again, but uh, you know, with more and more patients staying at home or looking for, you know, alternatives to traditional dentistry. I mean, the rise of teledentistry has been huge and we are in talks with a couple of teledentistry firms that are wanting to develop workloads for our product, which I think is fantastic because if you can narrow this down to one office visit compared to what a traditional denture or partial might be, yeah. you know, obviously that's, that's what, from a clinical standpoint, that's what they're looking for. Yeah, awesome. Are you guys busier than what you thought you would be this time in the pandemic and after? I, if it's even after, I don't know. But are you guys super slammed like the rest of us? Yeah, pretty pretty slammed. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, you know, when we first moved in here last year, that's when pretty much the whole country was on lockdown, certainly around the tri-state area. And then we opened up and it seems like every conversation I had with, with a lab owner, it was just like month over month, which just kept getting better and better. And it slowed down a little bit, I think, towards the end of December and, and pretty early into January. But yeah, we're slammed again. So nice. It's all good things. We slowed down a little bit this February. I was surprised. Usually March is one of our biggest months. So I'm hoping, you know, I know today's the end of the month and I'm hoping March is going to get busier. Last week was slow. I think the deep freeze, you know, across the country probably had some, yeah. some impact there. <laughs> I'm sure. Our nine inches of snow. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, we're used to it here up at the yeah. but, you know, when, when everybody in Texas is closed out for a week or more, that was that's, that's crazy. Yeah, that was crazy. And then there's me in Florida. Uh, yeah. Enjoying the beautiful much. weather. <laughs> One of my partners is based in Florida, so he uh, doesn't hesitate to rub that in every time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's been beautiful. So you mentioned earlier some of the other kind of, I don't know, is it resins? The resins that you print that aren't Valplast? Yeah. What else do you guys do? We have our own material for the try-in process. It's basically, a, it's a white yep. prototyping material, biocompatible. <laughs> we have a clear material that we actually developed it for surgical guys, but we print very few of them here because we don't, we don't do any surgical planning. Mm -hmm. We have a kind of a bluish color that we use for uh, impression trays. Okay. Yeah, we see very few of those, but some labs do want to outsource custom tray production. It yeah. kind of makes sense. I mean, you know, even though it's relatively easy to make in the lab, if you're kind of strapped for, you know, human capital and talented technicians, that's probably going to be one of the first things no, for you, sure. yeah. you, you nix so that they can focus on more complicated stuff. So. Yeah, so that, and then we print a lot of models too, obviously. Mm -hmm. So what are you guys working on next? What's going to be the new thing in 2021? Internally, making a lot of improvements in post-processing. So, you know, we're still doing, it's a pretty manual process to... Alcohol-based? Um, Chemical-based, yeah. You don't have to wash them in alcohol or? No, these parts come off the printer fully polymerized and no need to, you know, wash off. Or any light resin. cured? No light cure, no, no polymerization needed. Wow. It's, it's a thermoplastic, right? So, so like injection molding, it heats up and it cools down. And mm. as long as you can control the shrinkage, then, then that's it. So does it print warm or hot? Basically think of it like a glue gun on steroids, right? It's, oh. uh, yeah, it, it goes in as a hard, you know, kind of filament or, or like a glue stick and, and that it heats, it up. heats it up through a nozzle. And as soon <laughs> as it comes out there, you know, it gets cooled down by, you know, fans and, and print speeds. So interesting. But the drawback of this type of printing is that, you know, it does leave a relatively rough surface. It's not, you know, the, the le level of resolution or detail that you would get from a resin print, you know, SLA, DLP or, or any of the, yeah. the newer technologies from there. You know, so this is why most dental companies have stayed away from it. We approached it very early on because we saw that that was really the only feasible way to print Valplast, which is a type of nylon. But at the same time, if all it takes is, you know, we just have to smooth it down. I mean, that's nothing new to us as dental technicians. We know how to polish a denture. So, so we've done that. And now we're just working on how, how do we do that at scale? So we're, okay. yeah, we're, we're investing in some new technologies and making some changes here that allow us to do that. And so that's very exciting. What does post-production look like? We'll get back to what you're working on next, but now I'm yeah. curious. You got to pumice and polish and all that? And yeah, so it, it comes off the printer. You know, there are still supports attached to it, like any 3D print would have. Okay, uh, so sure. The, the supports get cut off, you know, mechanically separated. There is a, a process to sandblast it. So even though rotary instruments work faster, you know, a, a burr or, or a stone or something like that, yeah. you know, for like the intaglio surface, we need to smooth that out, but we don't want to really change the fit. So, you sure. know, we don't, and, and it would be super time consuming to go in there with a, with a burr. So we sandblast the inside of the denture just to get rid of some of the, the rough layers that develop from printing. And then the rest of it is done through rotary instruments. So, you know, burrs, uh, abrasives, glue the teeth in place, and then we polish it. It still takes a good amount of hand 
technician. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got it down to a science and a, and a routine. So I would say we do it faster than, you know, most labs do, at least their traditional, you know, flexibles or, or valve blasts. Oh, it I, takes them forever. <laughs> I've been in labs where, you know, technicians will spend, no joke, 45 minutes to an hour on a single case. Yeah. Um, just Easy. finishing it. And then they have to polish it. And I mean, yeah. that's obviously there's a lot of pre-planning that can go into that if it's designed properly, blocked out properly, duplicated, everything. So by doing everything digitally with CAD, you know, we have some additional control over that, you know, which makes total sense. And, and Barbara, as you said earlier, uniform thickness, you know, obviously yeah. that's quantified and completely controlled when we uh, design it digitally. But yeah, you know, it's basically just a matter of a matter of mechanically smoothing it out afterwards. We don't have to worry about the fit because we know that that was already, uh, you know, taken into account. Wow. That's cool. All right. Now back to what are you guys doing next? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, as far as distribution, I think the big thing you're going to see is, you know, more and more labs are going to offer this once they uh, check us out, test the product, yeah. find that it works and, you know, fits into their workflow really well, talk to their doctors. And, and you know, we do see labs that even if they still want to do everything in-house because they have that department built, they have that skill set, you know, which we totally get. Overflow work, rush cases, iOS scans, you know, as, as more and more docs are sending iOS scans, mm, you know, yeah. it's kind of counterintuitive. What are you going to do? You're going to print a model and then duplicate it just so you can do a hand wax injected denture, you know, or, yeah. or do you just want to upload that scan to our portal and have us do it for you? You know, it makes sense. And especially because then you keep everything digital. So the level of accuracy is, is still there. So yeah, we, we see that, you know, so labs large and small can take advantage of this and, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, teledentistry, you know, we're talking to some of the firms there. So you'll, you'll see more and more outlets for patients uh, having access to this product. Oh. Yeah. What sort of remake factor are you guys seeing? Oh, I, mean, I was obvious. thinking that. Probably low. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, I only ask because it's high yeah. here. It's just, it, it, I, don't, I don't mean to down talk your grandfather's dream here, but... It's a struggle. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, internally, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to share numbers. It's relative. It's it's very low. It's, I mean, it's yeah, single, yeah. single digits for sure. Low single That's digits. Good. Wow. Um, That's good. Externally, it's even lower. Internally, it's usually only when we have a print fail, which can happen with any printer. Well, um, you got a hundred of them. Yeah, for yeah sure. exactly. So, <laughs> you know, machines are machines. They're going to do what they want. And uh, yeah. yeah, so when we, when we come in in the morning, if we see that, then obviously they'll reprint it, which is not the end of the world. So we consider that an internal remake. As far as external remake, makes i mean the the factor is even lower than that and, and a lot of that is helped out because we have the online design preview process so yeah especially because we're doing the designs we push that to you new feature that we added last week is that that design that we push to the lab that has an open link that they can share with their dentist so if, if you really want that you know full communication loop down the line uh, you can share that design with your dentist and make sure everything's good to go that's cool yeah because the last thing we want to do is make a denture ship it to you that you're not happy with or that the dentist isn't happy with and then have to redo it especially if it's something over design because we can hit that very early on through you know the right communication when in doubt put the ball in their court that's right <laughs> well yeah, yeah. That's if, say, if yeah. nothing else at least it's documented <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they hit the approval button. It's really smart. I do a, a lot of outsource for designs and I always see the preview and tweak it and I'm able to make any changes before we go to the final. And I mean, that's really the only way because then yeah. again, they're taking responsibility for, for the design. So yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, ultimately how we kind of blend what the customer preferences are, you know, as far as design with what we know is going to work properly for the, yeah. for the appliance and also for our printing process. So, you know, there has to be a kind of, you know, middle road there. How many standard designs are there? Yeah, I mean, not as many class variations as you have from partial frame design, but, you know, we have a standard set. There's, you know, what we call a wraparound class, which is kind of like that gingival hook mm -hmm. that you'll see on almost every case has one. Those are, you know, it, it's both too thin, some small uh, portion of gingival undercut that's used for, for retention. It's great for retaining, you know, longer spans and also adding stability. So especially in distal extension cases, you're going to see a lot of those. But then for smaller, you know, uh, segments or, or pontex or bounded segments, you know, you may see... Um, uh, like a little spur, you know, like a little arm just kind of extending into a tooth undercut along, huh. along the peripheral. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a few different things. We have one called a split clasp. It looks almost like a roach clasp from RPD design. It gives it some extra flexibility along the horizontal axis. Yeah, you know, other, other than that, you know, like I said, not as much variation as with uh, traditional RPD design, but, you know, these are all things that have been planned and, uh, you know, have, have a purpose. It's not an arbitrary method by any means. Yeah. I imagine most of the RXs you get are just upper valplast because that's all we get. Yeah, yeah mo <laughs> most of the time. Yeah, and, and I mean, even back, you know, when I was doing more partial frames in the lab, you know, we would 
we would get some really complicated RXs, usually from, you know, residents at the local hospitals that were still sure, kind of going, yeah, going through yeah. their, their prosthodontic training. So, you know, they, they have yeah. to make reference to all this stuff. And they would yeah. o- over-engineer it in a lot of cases, you know, too many clasps, too many rests. You know, so we'll we'll help you find that middle ground. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, most prescriptions just you know upper lower flex, or, or you know, they yeah. don't even specify the brand half the time. No, no. But if they do, it's always Valplast. If they do, it's Valplast, <laughs> and that's uh, yeah. I mean, at the end, of, I commented on somebody's Facebook you know question yesterday. You know, which flexible system should I go with? And I didn't make mention of mine, but I said, hey, you know, just go with the one the doctors are asking for, and, and you know what that is. You know, otherwise, that is, it's the only one. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to be the salesperson, right? You're going to be the one saying, well, it's. It's like Valplast, but, right? Yeah. And, and you have to explain, you know, exactly. th- there's always a caveat, yeah. right? Um, yeah. and, and some of them are pretty good. I mean, I've seen some of the other materials out there, but, you know, considering we also have a 70-year history, we've seen a lot of materials come and go, right? They come come and go in, in cycles. Oh, sure. A lot of materials that were available in the 60s and the 80s and the 90s that are no longer available. And I'm sure we'll see that, uh, you know, happen again. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. What about making adjustments to these? Is it just like traditional Valplast? Because everyone talked about how hard it is and it shreds. Yeah. And- yeah. So, I mean, if adjustments are needed, we basically use the same tool set and, and I'll, yeah. I'll go over that. It's worth noting that using the digital process, we, we aim to have fewer adjustments, especially, of course. especially yeah. coming from an iOS scan, because then everything is really preserved as far as accuracy. And the other big thing there to point out is that the accuracy of iOS scans when it comes to tissue scanning, we have always advocated for mucus static impressioning with Valplast. If you use a physical impression material, especially a medium or heavy body, you know, silicone material, it's going mm-hmm. to displace the tissues. Uh, when I oh, say displace, yeah. it's actually going to compress them. So if you have a tight fitting partial and it's stemmed from one of those impressions, okay, it makes sense. The partial feels like it's static on the model that we pour up, but if it's actually uh, compressive in the mouth, it's, it's not passive then that's going to cause all of the, that tightness in those sore spots. So iOS definitely solves a lot of that. But uh, yeah, I mean, if adjustments are needed, it is the same material. So I have always advocated that just a simple kind of green stone works the best, like a bullet-shaped green stone. Uh-huh. They're super inexpensive. They work really well. They work very similar to like heatless diamonds, uh, <laughs> which, yep. which also work pretty well. But Valplast Corporation, some of the burr manufacturers, they, you know, develop their own kits for, for Valplast or sure, flexible yeah. materials. And, you know, th- there's stuff in there that works, you know, carbide burrs that actually do work pretty well with this material. I use them in the lab routinely because uh, they cut they cut through Valplast like butter. Would I advocate a clinician to use it? Probably not. I, I hope you don't have to make adjustments to that level to a finished yeah. prosthetic, right? If you mm-hmm. did, then there's something really wrong with the impression or the denture. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you just need to round out, you know, reduce a peripheral border or inside a clasp is too tight, you know, you could use a green stone for that. If you have to move to a carbide or something more aggressive, then I would definitely raise some red flags over, you know, what's going on in the first place. Yeah. What about relining and repairing? Is that still kind of a no-no? Yeah, no. So it, it's always been possible. Any lab who has original Valplast equipment or, or really any injection system for that matter, the ability to inject a case, they can add a class, they can do a, a, a reline or, or like a rebase. That's all very huh. possible. So they were just telling me they can't because they don't want to. I <laughs> they don't want to yeah, for, for, for a couple of reasons. Either <laughs> they don't have the equipment and don't want to do it or they don't know how to do it. And unfortunately, this has kind of trickled down the supply chain to the dentist who they hear that enough times and they just think the material can't be relined or added to. That's not true. Your lab just told you that. So especially if Joe Lab down the street is sending me their Valplast, he doesn't want to send that out for repair. He's just going to tell his doctor it can't be done. Yeah. So that's where that misconception came from. Now, to the original question, can 3D printed Valplast be added to and modified? It can, but only through that injection process. So uh-huh. what we do offer is on existing dentures that need tooth additions and, and repairs and things like that. If it's a case that we designed initially, we will offer a discount on a new brand new denture if we need to oh, add, add a tooth or a clasp. Yeah. We, we still have the original CAD file. It's very easy for us to you know make that modification and design. And we'd rather do that then open up a, a department just to you know accept repairs and have to deal with that uh, we did for a number of years when when i was running master touch we did a lot of repairs yeah but now you know because the cost actually does allow it from an economic standpoint uh, we could print a new one for about the same price yep. interesting that's a huge benefit oh absolutely yeah. yeah well we're coming up on an hour justin but i wanted to touch base how you got connected with the school you mentioned that you're there with uh, Renata, right? Yep, Renata. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, so I mean, I, I have a, 
I'm going to say a long history with them. I've only been in this 15 years, but my uncle, Peter Nagy, who's the president yeah. of Valplast, he was on the advisory board there at City Tech for a very long time. And so- Did he go to that school? He or? did not go to that school. Hmm. How'd you guys get into this school? Nobody went there. Well, he, he was he was on the advisory board just as, a, as an industry member, right? Because yeah. on the advisory board, they have local lab owners, uh, manufacturer representatives, you know, all, all sorts of people from, from sure. the industry. He started bringing me to some of those meetings and I kind of took over that role. This is probably 10 years ago now. Wow. Yeah. And then I think once they realized that I was a CDT with a bachelor's degree, they said, well, th those are really hard to find. And those are the requirements for teaching here. Would you be interested? And at the time, I, I had the time to do it. So I was teaching there as an adjunct one day a week doing the RPD lab and lecture blocks. Like I said, I had to step back from that for the last two semesters because I was so busy with, with our phone or printing. But uh, mm -hmm. it looks like in the fall, I'll probably be doing some virtual uh, lectures for them again. So uh, pretty happy to be doing that because they, they have... You started off teaching frameworks and yeah, you know, I mean they, that kind of design. Yeah, at, at the school, you know, we, we do teach flexible dentures in one of the advanced denture uh, electives in, in their uh, fourth semester. Uh -huh. I wasn't teaching that class, but uh, as a requirement, they all have to do RPDs. And uh, as you can imagine, it's difficult to find lecturers and educators who can who can teach that. So Wow. How many past students are working at our phono now? Um, <laughs> right now we have a couple. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they work as a great feeder school to, to us because uh, I bet. We, we always go to them first when we need to make hiring decisions and, and to find candidates. That's that's a really valuable asset for us here in the, in the area. Sure. Gosh, it's almost a reason to open a lab over there. Well, it's one of the it's <laughs> one of the reasons I started teaching there, so I so I know who the who the top talent is. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And then when did you get connected with Digital Dental Craftsman? That happened a couple of years ago. So I've known Sander for, for many years now, mm. Sander Polanco. Oh, yeah, he's there in your area. Yeah, yeah, he's he's in the area. And he actually he's actually teaching at, at the college now as well. That's right. That's right, yeah. We had some overlap there. It was really cool to see him when I went in there once a week. He, he actually came to take my Valplast course years ago when he first purchased the system for his lab. And so yeah. we you know, kind of stayed in touch over the years. And obviously, he's, he's everywhere now. And wow. they wanted somebody to come in who had a, you know, a knowledge of uh, not just partials, but digital dentures, you know, since we're at the point now where all of that's going digital and, and everybody's asking yeah. for it, that seems to be the buzzword and know a thing or two about it. So, uh, so that's, that's been really, really fun because they have such a phenomenal group of talent there. Yeah. Yeah. Have you taught in their uh, digital world yet? I did a webinar recently, and I think I think that aired through uh, DDC World. Um, I know, yeah. it, I mean, they definitely did it on Facebook Live, but I think it was in DDC World as well. Sure. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And then before all of this craziness happened, I, I got to do a couple of hands-on courses with them too at their training facility. So that was a lot of fun. Wow. That's awesome, man. I think you're doing a wonderful service to our industry. Thanks. Uh, with these flexibles, man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we certainly think so. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we see this as such a recession-proof type of economy-proof restoration where... It, always falls in the middle of the spectrum of all of the options, right? At the top end, yeah. yeah, you know, hearing a lot about implants and especially the full arch stuff. But for partials, I mean, yeah, even the people who get implants, you know, they may wear something like this, you know, as an interim, as a, as a, oh, as yeah. a temp, right, or provisional. And then at the yeah. other end of the spectrum, which is which is a huge part of the market, you know, people who don't go to the dentist, people who have a really old flipper that should have been temporary, but they're still wearing it, you know, and they keep gluing it together, or they're, you know, wearing fix it in. And, oh, God, uh, yeah. This is yeah. an upgrade for them, but it's also, you know, something temporary for the people who might be able to afford something uh, better. So our goal is to really make affordable tooth replacement. And, you know, end of the day, a patient can still walk into a dental office and be charged $1,500 or more for what we're making here. And, you know, we're, we're hoping that 3D printing can make that even more economical for them. Yeah. Sounds like it is. Yeah. yeah get it to the masses. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Justin, we appreciate you coming on the program. That was, uh, that's some cool stuff. Thanks, guys. I really yeah. appreciate it. Love what you're doing. You guys are up front and center in everything in the industry, not not just with the podcast, but just uh, in, in your, your roles and what you do in the industry. So thanks. Huge thanks to you for that. And yeah, big fan. Awesome. We appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll be able to see you sometime. Yeah. <laughs> we all get back together. So, yeah, I know. I mean, as it turns out, I guess this week is when we would all be in Chicago. So. I know. <laughs> it hurt. It hurt. Oh, it's, it's just <laughs> such a bummer seeing all these photos come up from last year yeah. on Facebook and social media. Yes. You know, it's, uh, it's you know, from, yes. from one point of view, it's like, oh, I can't believe a year flew by already. It doesn't seem like that was that long ago. And then at the same time, you know, it was missing everybody and seeing everybody so close together without masks on <laughs> yeah oh, I know. it's uh, it's so so it's weird. world now i told my wife this week i'm not even supposed to be here this week <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs>
I've always been gone this week. Yep. yep. <laughs> awesome, Justin. Well, we appreciate it, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. 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 Whitmix is super excited to announce the new Pro 4K large format 3D printer from Asiga. The open material printer for 385NM and 405NM resins features renowned Asiga reliability and super fast print mode for large batch printing of virtually all print resins. It's ideal for printing any kind of model, dentures, splints, surgical guides, impression trays, and more. As with other Asiga printers, the Pro 4K features the SPS, Smart Positioning System Technology, which ensures that the build platform is in the correct position when forming each layer, providing repeatable accuracy and production continuity. The Asiga Pro 4K DL printer is priced at under 25 grand has a large build plate, and is available in both versions. For more information about the Asiga Pro 4K, visit Whitmix.com. We appreciate your support of the podcast, Whitmix. A huge thanks to Justin for coming on our podcast and creating a much, much needed printed flexible partial. It's cool to hear that the grandson of the creator of Valplast is still making them with the same material, but in a new digital way. So everybody head over to arfonaprinting.com to learn more about the products offered and to see just how easy it is to send the case. That's all we got for you. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Oh, seriously? Anywho.